My name's Kate Clements, I'm a curator here at IWM um, and I curated the new Second World War galleries that we have here. What was the Enigma machine? So the Enigma machine was um, a machine which could encipher messages so that you could send them securely, you could communicate securely between um, different um, organisations. Um, so the German military started to use it um, in the 1930s um, more earnestly than it had done. Um, Enigma had been invented in the 1920s by a German engineer actually for commercial use, so for companies to use to um, be able to encode their designs or their inventions, stop other people stealing them. Um, but the German um, armed forces took this up and when Germany began to re rearm um, in a, a, a great amount in the 1930s, the different German um, armed forces used Enigma to be able to communicate um, se um, securely between each other. Um, so this was really, really useful for um, the armed forces during that time, but then when it switches to war, it's even more important that they're able to communicate securely. So what the Germans did at the start of the war was that they increased the security around Enigma, and this made it more difficult for the co-breakers at Bletchley Park to work out what they were saying to each other. How did the machine work? So the machine itself, it looks um, fairly robust, maybe a little bit primitive, kind of a bit like a typewriter, but it's a bit sort of complicated what's going on there. So um, it's, the way that it's able to work securely is that it has these different settings, two different types of settings within it, which you have to know what they are in order to set it up and to use it to be able to read the messages by um, different Enigma operators. Um, and so the Germans would have a code book um, and those settings would change each day. So that made it more difficult for the Allies to work out what was happening because they, they'd only have a day to try and work out what they were. Um, and what you do is you'd um, set, um, there's a series of plugs on, on, the, on the baseboard of it um, and you'd, they're in pairs, you'd set that up in a specific way according to the daily codes and then the, there are three rotors, um, usually three, sometimes there are more in other Enigma machines and you'd set those to a specific configuration. So once you've done that, you can then type in your message in plain text on what looks like a typewriter keyboard and those, each of those letters you type in lights up another letter on the lamp board and that's what you write down to use in your message. Um, the messages are then sent um, in Morse code via radio, uh, wireless as it was at the time, and that's how the Allies could intercept them. So they could find these messages but they didn't make any sense to them. What happened at Bletchley Park during World War II? Bletchley Park, um, which is just sort of north of London, it was the government's code and cipher school um, and Alan Turing actually worked there part time before the war broke out but when it did break out he, he became full time and he was part of a team which worked to crack the Enigma code um, and that team was headed by a man called Dilly Knox and he'd been a co-breaker in the First World War so he continued that work and that learning which he'd had in the First War and he took it through to the Second and one of the first challenges they had at Bletchley Park was cracking Germany's Enigma code. So Churchill was really keen on Bletchley Park. He went to visit and he immediately understood the um, potential of what they were doing there and the intelligence that they were gleaning um, and how valuable this could be to the Allies. Um, so Churchill backed them and there was actually one point where Alan Turing wrote to Churchill and asked him for more help, uh, more resources for Bletchley Park and Churchill approved this and um, that, that happened and as a result Bletchley was able to continue. At its height it had about 7,000 people working there and they were decrypting 5,000 mes messages a day so it's quite a significant operation which remains secret. How did Alan Turing become involved? So Alan Turing was um, a mathematical genius. Um, he studied at um, Cambridge and Princeton universities um, and he was um, sort of headhunted for Bletchley Park to work at the Code and Cipher School. Um, other Cambridge mathematicians also found their way there, so it was a sort of a bit of a recruiting ground for Bletchley. Um, and he, yeah, he was there from the start and he um, set, you know, set the challenge of breaking the Enigma code and he, he sort of came up with these really ingenious ways of doing it. You know, he could see things and work out ways to approach the problem which others couldn't. So he sort of quite rightly is earned his place um, as being a notorious code breaker at Bletchley. He's also known as the father of modern computing, computer science, I should say, because he invented what's 
widely believed to be the sort of early forerunner to the modern computer that we'd recognise today. So he was really ahead of his time. Um, and he worked at Bletchley um, throughout the war. He also went over to the States at one point to sort of talk to their security services and share information and knowledge. Um, but yeah, he was integral to the cracking of the, the Luftwaffe Enigma codes and then later the naval ones as well. And he led the team in Hut 8 at Bletchley Park, which cracked those naval codes. How was Enigma cracked by the team? The cracking of Enigma was really a group effort. So um, Polish codebreakers um, started working on it in the um, early 1930s. Um, and there was a man called Rajewski, um, and he worked out the settings and um, how, how the kind of inner workings of the Enigma um, were set up. Um, and he did that by using um, a, a sort of a, a manual for the Enigma machine, which um, the Polish had received from French sources. So he used this to work out um, sort of how Enigma could be cracked. Um, and before um, Poland was invaded by Germany in 1939, the the Polish um, co-breakers handed over this information, this intelligence they'd already gleaned about the machine, to the British. Um, so the British were able to have a bit of a head start there, basically. Um, but they knew how important and how useful it would be to be able to read the German traffic that was being sent between its armed forces as the war broke out and, and how integral that would be to Britain's ability to fight the war. So they put some effort into it um, at Bletchley Park. And Alan Turing was part of this initial team. Um, the team was led by a man called Dilly Knox, who had been a co-breaker in the First World War. Um, and there were other mathematicians there. Um, Alan Turing was a, a mathematical genius, really. Um, he'd uh, studied at both Cambridge and Princeton universities, and that's why he'd been sort of snapped up by the government's code and cipher school. So he took a key role in that um, early work to crack Enigma. And the first ones that they read were the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe communiques. Um, and they did that by using the bomb machine that um, Alan Turing developed and that Gordon Welshman contributed to. Um, and it basically sped up the work of code breakers, which they'd have had to do by hand to try and work out these different settings. Um, so because it was a machine, um, it could be operated to do that work for them. So it, it really helped them to be able to um, work out what the Enigma um, communications were in 1940. So January 1940, they work out what that is. And they're able to read those German Air Force communications throughout 1940, which is really key for Britain because obviously that was the year that Britain came under such intense attack from the air from Germany. How much of a role did Turing's work play in protecting Britain? So he was important and he was um, one of many at Bletchley Park um, who were able to do this work which really did help um, Britain's war effort. Um, you know, th there's been sort of talk about how it shortened the war. That, that's probably fair to say. It certainly saved lives. You know, it avoided um, larger amounts of casualties, which could have been if we hadn't had this crucial bit of intelligence at these certain points in the war and were able to use it. Um, so, you know, he built on work of Polish co-breakers. There were obviously other co-breakers working in his team and helping him to crack this Enigma code. So he didn't do it all on his own, but he was a key part of it. So the Battle of the Atlantic was a really crucial battle for Britain and it's not one that's perhaps that widely talked about or known about but it was basically Britain's lifeblood. So Britain obviously being an island um, and a sort of seafaring nation relied on getting supplies across the Atlantic and the German U-boat attacks um, during the battle, during the war, um, were really devastating. They were really, really um, challenging Britain's ability to basically stay in the war. So the fact that Bletchley Park, um, Alan Turing was involved in this, um, breaking the naval enigma, which was more difficult than the Luftwaffe one had been. Um, the fact that Bletchley was able to break this and start being able to warn the British as to where the wolf packs were, which was the, the groups of U-boats which attacked Allied convoys trying to get troops and supplies and material across to Britain. Um, the fact that they were able to do this was really crucial. So um, I think that was from um, 1941 they were able to do this, but in um, early 1942 um, they stopped being able to read the Enigma codes from the German Navy um, because they became more difficult to crack. Um, they added a layer of security which made it suddenly unreadable. So they basically had a blackout in terms of what was going on. So this was really, really bad and you can see how the battle then really starts to spike again in terms of against Britain's favour. 
Um, but eventually, um, they were able to capture some code books from um, a U-boat that was sunk. Those code books made their way to Bletchley Park, and within a matter of hours, they had worked out once again how to read the German naval signals. So that they were able to then turn the tide of that battle. But it was really important to Britain's survival, really, in the war. Was Turing treated as a hero for his role in World War II? Well, kind of not. Um, he was given the OBE for his war um, services to the war afterwards, um, but I suppose because his work was secret and it wasn't widely known about, he wasn't or couldn't be hailed as a hero. Um, so actually, he doesn't receive the treatment that you might think someone who'd made that vital of a contribution should have received. So in fact, um, in 1952, he was arrested for homosexuality, which was then illegal. Um, he avoided prison because he opted for chemical castration. Um, and a couple of years later, he was found dead um, by cyanide poisoning. Um, the inquest ruled it was suicide. There's been some you know, um, issues about whether that, that is the case or not. But um, what's true is that, that you know, he, he didn't kind of receive the accolades that you might think he did. That decision, that arrest, was overturned in 2013. And I think since the 1990s, since the work at Bletchley Park has become more widely known, uh, and now we know pr pretty much all, all we know about Alan Turing's role there, um, and movies like The Imitation Game, which are sort of um, making clear his role. I think, um, you know, his legacy is very clear. And, you know, thankfully, he's now remembered as someone who re was really um, integral to Britain's um, survival in the war. Did The Imitation Game portray the story correctly? So, um, The Imitation Game, really great movie to watch, but like all movies, there'll be elements which are truthful, elements which are quite not quite right, but that's a sort of artistic licence. But I think what they basically do get right is um, the ethos of the work at Bletchley Park, and the sort of um, intensity and the kind of time pressures that people are under there. And in terms of Alan Turing's portrayal, I think they get it right in terms of he was this genius and he sort of was a little bit quirky, he was perhaps a little bit socially awkward, he was known as the prof, that was his nickname, um, but ultimately a very determined and hard-working man who put his mind um, to, to work during the war for a really crucial reason.